We cover many serious issues in this podcast. This discussion may contain reference to domestic violence, sexual violence, violence against children, suicide, drug use, or graphic depictions of death or dead bodies. It is not suitable for all audiences. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries Rewind. Two friends get together to discuss episodes of their favorite television show, Unsolved Mysteries. Will they find answers? Will anyone care? You may be able to solve a mystery. Hello, this is Mark, and you're listening to Unsolved Mysteries Rewind. I am on tonight with my co-host, Kim. How are you, Kim? I'm great, thanks. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great. And today, we are talking about Unsolved Mysteries Season 5, Episode 1. It aired sometime in September 1992. Mm -hmm. This looks like it was from 1992. This is is a loaded episode, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. Heavily criticized, too. Hmm. Um, so what we're going to be covering in this particular episode is, I think the big, big story is Tammy Lynn Leppert, Leppert, yes. Leppert. Leppert. Um, and she was a beauty queen since the age of four mm-hmm. and she's nowhere in this episode. Do you want to talk no. about why? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Tammy has been missing since 1983. Uh, We meet her mom, Linda Curtis. Her mom is like her modeling agent, and it's like toddlers and tiaras. She is just kind of putting her out for the modeling world from the age of four. Yeah. It's really one of those things where we immediately, we were talking earlier about Honey Boo Boo, which is Mm -hmm. one of these, um, and we call her a phenomena. Yeah, I think so. A phenomenon. So, you know, there is that culture of people who have beauty pageants and there always seems to be some level of strangeness um, associated with it. Almost like, like putting, you wish you were up there doing the little dance and twirl as the mom kind of thing. And there's a photo of, um, of Tammy later on where she's, I think 14, I think they say she Mm. is. Mm -hmm. And she does not look 14. And I felt like a total, um, I felt like a complete sicko thinking that because I'm like, she doesn't, she looks like a woman, like a young woman and she shouldn't, she's a kid. That's kind of how they want that. Yeah. And that's why I don't like Tammy. No. Yeah. No, this whole thing is, is skeevy and gross when you add like the pageant world in of like, let's rank how beautiful and attractive these girls are. Swimsuit section, you know, and it's just so cringy. And they're kind of trying to, exploit her in a way they call spring break a movie that she got offered a little bit part in very they good movie it... by the way no i'm just i never saw it actually oh. <laughs> well they call it a teen exploitation film and she is allegedly if you look at the movie poster it's these teen boys like sticking a flag in this woman's bikini clad woman's like yeah. but yeah and supposedly that was her abdominal and hips region that is that they... her on the cover that's what the that's what the rumor is. Oh, yes, we can't. Really, I mean, it, it's just the tukas, so we uh, we can't really say for sure. But yeah, I would believe that they would just take her picture and it would be her. And I mean, she later is offered a role in Scarface when she's like seventeen years old as a bikini girl who's used to distract one of the lookout guys when a crime's going on. It's often referred to as like the chainsaw torture shower scene. Uh, Am I getting uh, the sense that you've never seen Scarface? No, I haven't. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yeah. That it's more than just the chainsaw scene. It is horrifying. And it is, um, even when you first watch it just on television, you're, you're shocked, right? So she's being, she's kind of the distraction for one of the people outside who's involved in this. They're supposed to be a lookout, I believe. Mm-hmm. And she's like the bikini clad girl who is just kind of there. She's really kind of, I guess, a featured extra, I would say. Mm-hmm. It's not really a role. I would. I, I don't recall there being a speaking role. 
Yeah, I think she is just a featured player. But again, she's like 16 or 17 when she's like shoving her bikini boobs in this guy's face to try and distract him. On the set of Scarface. On the set of Scarface. And we're all supposed to kind of be ogling her like, oh, why wouldn't he be distracted? Ay, yay, yay. But it's like, okay, she is like a child. Mm -hmm. So now her story is very, very interesting. She, in between Spring Break and Scarface, the movies, she went to an unchaperoned party and returned, and I quote, a completely different person. So she is getting some really paranoid overtones. Supposedly, she used to be this sweet, bubbly, pretty little thing, and now she's just like, oh my god, there's a van out there. They can see me, but I can't see them. Oh, my God. People are trying to poison me. Like, she thinks even her own family is trying to poison her. Yeah. I so, think it's kind of strange, though, how it's it seems to have happened overnight. I mean, did something happen with, like, a Weinstein-type character at this party? Because it's not really out of the realm of possibility. You know, Scarface was directed by Brian De Palma. It was written by Oliver Stone. It starred mm-hmm. Al Pacino. Um, you know, these are people who not necessarily are people of the me too movement, but there's definitely people who were surrounded by the people of the me too movement. And we're talking about Florida in the eighties. I'm assuming that there is just Coke coating everything at this point. So is this some kind of drug induced psychosis? Because to me, she kind of has some signs of paranoid schizophrenia when she thinks that like her mother and her kind of surrogate brother kind of situation are trying to poison her. And she's, they show her just in her room and she's just twitching out and looking at everything. Cause she's just convinced that somebody's out to get her. So they say later that they did take her to do a drug and alcohol, alcohol like mental health screening and she was clean but cocaine only stays in your system for like two or three days Mm. so this is a a good deal after the party and so she's staying down in miami while she's filming scarface with this family friend walter lebowitz yeah he he's a he's an attorney and he gets a call one day from the people on scarface it's like the fourth day of filming she's standing around this crowd who is She's like standing around watching the scene that's filmed where a man gets shot in the head and she freaks out over this. Mm -hmm. She's screaming like, they're going to get me. They're going to get me too. Like she freaked out so bad that they had to put her in a trailer to try and calm her down. And that's when Walter Lebowitz came. But Walter Lebowitz, just a by the by. Another shady guy. Yeah. Yeah. He was disbarred, by the way. He got in trouble for selling a three day old baby. What kind of baby? No, I'm kidding. Uh, That's terrible. Like, I mean, at this point, um, I didn't, you know, I couldn't find why he was disbarred. Was this the reason he was, um, I'm going to call trafficking children in a way. I mean, that's from a trafficking, right? Well, I would say, but yeah, he was acquitted. Mm. He was trying to make it seem, I believe like, oh, I'm, I'm just doing the adoption without an adoption agency. I'm a good guy. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, again, I would not leave my daughter who i'm trying to get scantily clad and made up and all this stuff with this guy but wouldn't you though if you were the mother who's putting her in these outfits for probably mm-hmm. most of her life if pageants, I was this mother yeah i would like oh <laughs> well, you can believe him he's an attorney you know i think yeah. there's a certain connection there where we, we put a lot of trust into certain people who have titles at the end of their name and when it's esquire you think oh he's he's above the law and, you know, Tammy was her mom's only patient. So I have the feeling it's like, go on, Tammy. You got to make us our rent this month. You know, like that kind yeah. of situation. So I think it's like, is that guy molesting you? Maybe like I'm going to look the other way, which I'm not saying Walter Leibowitz molested her. But I'm just saying I don't think that this mom had her best interests as like a human being that she was evolving. I don't think that that was on the mom's forefront. Yeah. I'm, at first I was thinking Walter Leibowitz was perhaps acting as her agent. But but when you look at the big picture here, she really didn't have much of a career in film. No. I mean, that's the reality here. But she's on, she's in IMDb not because of her um, film, but her film, film career of two films, but right. because of this particular situation where she vanished pretty much overnight. And she is a very beautiful, very skinny, blonde, white girl. So, of course... People are going to say like, oh, they're, you know, Unsolved Mysteries is paying attention. Her IMDb is all about this because she's beautiful. And but I mean, 
it's just what it is. She no, is beautiful. She's a beautiful um, young lady. And she definitely has that bubbly personality, very photogenic. But they do this one photo, and I couldn't help but start laughing about it, where they have age progression. I put it in our notes if you scroll down it to it. It is hideous. She has, like, this weird lazy eye. <laughs> Um, her, it's like she has a brain tumor behind her nose and it's like pushing her eyeballs out. Like it, it is not at all what she would look like. Or is it exactly what she looks like? <laughs> I mean, I, I hope know. not. This is not anything what I think she would look like except for the hair maybe at best. Yeah. I mean, I, I like facial features like your eye width don't usually change. And her I teeth, know. I mean, you know, it's um, it's an artist rendition. I mean, it's not something that's truly accurate. But when you look at the other eight photographs that they have surrounding, it's like, who's this? Yeah, it's exactly. Very yeah, strange. Very strange. Knockout. Yeah. So she's like bugging out. They take her. They do the drug uh, testing. They take her for mental testing. They can't find anything wrong with her. So they release her after 72 hours. And she hears her mom, or her mom hears her say, like, I know you don't want to hear this, but he is going to try to kill me. And when he does kill me, like, you need to avenge me. Right. Which is weird for your 16-year-old to say to you. And she truly thinks someone's after her. Like, it is really sad if if, if nobody is after her and if this is all in her mind. My God, what a horrible existence. This sounds to me, and... Um... Not, not we do this every once in a while where we'll bring in um, knowledge of drugs and mm -hmm. it's i think it's possible maybe she took angel dust and yeah. saw that scene happen maybe she was on dust when this happened and it really affected her in a very very deep way um mm -hmm. but if there are drugs involved i'm thinking she had a a bad experience at that party and oh, something yeah. Maybe something terrible didn't happen, but it was her perception of it that clicked. It made, it made something un, not unclick. Personally with me, I have four main theories that I will get to after, okay. like once we wrap up, but I, I'm with you. I'm with I you. do not want you saying anything negative about Wing Flanagan. I mean, if I'm And his fro, the fro man. <laughs> I'm fine with his fro. I think Wing is one of the quote unquote models that like, lives with them and is kind of her brother but he's like oh yeah she was tammy like he, he would, was into yeah. her oh my god he was in love with her yeah he's like, like she would kiss me and it it wouldn't wash off it's like ew this is supposed to be your sister you weirdo right and um you know he went on to make a film called um kanash Ka wait, kanashimi mm -hmm. in 2015 which is a short um and i i tried to find a copy of it i haven't been able to but I would really like to watch it. You found a YouTube channel. Yeah, I found like him visiting his mom's burial site and like oh. scattering or like scattering her ashes or something. And I was like, all right, Wing, I'm not going to go after you too hard. But I do think that that was weird. I do think he was in love with her. I, I But look at her. I mean, she's, she's uh, gorgeous and she's bubbly. Like you said, she's got like a, a happy light around her. I think Wing was the guy who's like walking in the bathroom <laughs> unannounced. <laughs> Yeah, She's getting yeah. out of the shower and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that he was got to lock the door. Which Thought I do not condone. <laughs> but, but he is not her brother. And no. yeah, I mean, but I think he's a kid here and he definitely is in love with this girl who's kind of his sister. Which again, if you're the mom, you don't really want to be bringing strange preteen adolescent boys around your like smoking hot daughter, I would think. Yeah, but yeah, she's unaware. She doesn't, she thinks attention from anywhere is probably yeah. a positive thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I just personally would not be my parent. Oh, it's child. creepy and I, as and hell. I have no kids. Yeah. Well, um, we, I think I might have mentioned this. When we were younger, um, a friend of mine came and lived with us, right? Mm -hmm. but, it, but nothing creepy ever happened. He wasn't walking down to my mom or anything. But I mean, it, <laughs> There, there is a certain level of of what's normal and what's not normal, and the way he was kind of talking about her was a little bit creepy. And granted, oh, yeah. it could have been edited to sound creepy, and it could have pushed for these creepy, creepy, creepy <laughs> quotes. But yeah, it definitely did not come off as, um, you know, it was definitely impure thoughts going on with Wing. Yeah, I definitely agree. Poor so guy. 
Well, she is sitting there one day, and I have to say, I, this reenactor actress is amazing. I think that she sold it. Yeah, me too, except her wig was pretty bad. but Her wig was atrocious. There were wigs on wigs on wigs in this episode, like in this particular segment. The mom's <laughs> wig looked like a, a British magistrate's wig. It was ridiculous. It's like but... when you go to college and have a meal plan and you have to spend it all in one day. It's like, all right, we have these credits for wigs. We have to use them. <laughs> Let's go everybody, people. Time is money. Everybody. They tried to get Wing to wear a wig. <laughs> God, I wish he would have. But... I, I like the guy who acted him out, though. I thought he had a pretty good head of hair. And I think he did a great job too. I yeah, think Little did. Wing in the reenactment was great. So one day, Tammy Little Wing, gets, <laughs> that's funny. So Little Wing <laughs> and Tammy are chilling at home one day, and she's like, "Why are you staring at me?" And he's like, and he's not, and he's like, "I wasn't." And so she's like, "Ugh, screw you." So she goes outside, and she gets locked outside, and they do that like Jaws shot, you know, where they yeah. like zoom in while zooming out, and everybody around her is like. Ooh, it, it was kind of creepy. She's she's just scared that somebody's out there. And so she's like, let me in. Let me in. And the door is locked. So she takes a baseball bat and starts like smashing out the windows in her house to try and get in. It's like, whoa, this girl definitely thinks somebody is after her. And Wing's like, what are you doing? Yeah. And she's like, you son of a, why get away from me? And like her mom is like, it's me. It's me. And she's like shaking her. And when you see Tammy, the reenactor, little Tammy, when you see her, realize it's the mom she like her whole body relaxes yes like she did a great job so she is like mom i'm I'm gonna go out for a little while like i love you i'll see you later so the mom's like all right sweetheart like i'm on the phone keep it down (laughs) that's another thing she's just like yeah and i'll have um Work fried rice and you know i'm on the phone tammy my you know my wife my daughter's having a nervous breakdown here but it's like she's just on the phone yeah totally and she's like giving the like finger like just one second to tammy and tammy's just like i love you and she walks out the door barefoot wearing a jean skirt blue shirt so she goes and a friend who they never mention on the show but you know i got that info he picks her up and they get into an argument and he quote drops her off outside of the glass bank in florida no he, was the was the friend rick adams or i'm kind of forgetting no. his name no, no um, rick adams was another friend who we did talk to they never said the name of this kid and i had to find the police report to, in order to find out who this guy's name was now they don't name him because he's not considered a suspect but i think he's your number one suspect he's 100%. the last person yeah he's the last person seen alive with her he goes oh yeah, I just dropped this pretty blonde girl off in the center of town. Who knows what happened to her? And yeah. he, he actually was supposed to meet with Detective Jim Scraggs, who we see twice on this episode. And he blew off that meeting twice. And that's it. They have never gone back to him. Yeah, th- it seems like this is such a big story that it's possible. And I hate to say something negative about Unsolved Mysteries, but I feel like they really rushed through this. There are so many things. I, I mean, I heard so many rumors and so many things about this particular case and the situation yeah. that she was in. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you you came across a lot of the same type of things where it's possible that when she vanished, she was pregnant. Oh, yeah. No, it was probable that when she vanished, yeah. she was pregnant because her sister says she was three months pregnant. So I I believe that story. But there was a lot. And I heard from this website. I'll just cite it now so I don't forget because I got a lot of my information from a blogger who goes by Sherlock Holmes, but sure is spelled S H U R. Amazing reporting. I think it was in capitals, so that was annoying, but like really <laughs> did a deep dive. Yeah, that's uh, how you know it's good. <laughs> right, that when they're screaming at you. So it it really was good. Lots of resources like you wouldn't believe like different Google Maps scenarios that she could have taken and it was really in depth. So I literally did not go to the link when you said that you wanted to announce on the air the dirt. Okay, thank so you. I, I, I was like, I really wanted to. And <laughs> while I was researching, I did see the link in the search field. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do it. Not, thank you. Not gonna... I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I think that even if I went to it, that I would miss whatever you dug up. It was really like, like I think it's more fun to, to kind of, if we don't come in with the same exact information. No, 100%. So. Well, so her mom says that the detectives say, oh, she just ran away. And 
it's not probable because she was going to California for three months to like try and get into acting there. So her mom's like, if she wanted to get away from us, she was going to get away from us. Like yeah. it's not that big of a deal. She was just about to. And I've seen a lot of people say, Oh, well there was all these serial killers in the area at the time that targeted like beautiful blonde models. The, Chances of her running down the road hysterical and one of those serial killers like popping up and offering her a ride no. is, is it's way too much. It's way too coincidental. So I like immediately kicked that story out. Not to mention that's like two or three years before they reportedly even got started. Yeah, so, I think it's way too coincidental for something like that to have happened. Now, yeah. I do think that the I have to agree with you that the friend who was in the car with her, who mm -hmm. they had an argument and. He's like, all right, get out. You're yeah. barefoot. Who does that? Even if you don't like the person, you at least bring them to a spot. Unless a they're, space unless space. they're kind of going crazy. I mean, who knows? Maybe yeah. she's like literally grabbing at him and flailing. And it doesn't seem to be totally um, uncharacteristic for her to be physical even at this sure. point. Sure. Yeah. I mean, she went after Lil Wing with a baseball bat earlier. But he but... didn't say that. He just said that they are, had an argument and he let her yeah. out. Yeah. And she, and she wanted to be let out. But I have to say, because we are talking about barefoot, apparently, according to Sherlock Holmes, Unsolved Mysteries purposely misleads people so that they can suss out their credible leads that they get on hmm. the phone lines. So she actually wasn't barefoot. She was wearing gray flip flops. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And there's a lot of little like ticky tack details that don't really matter, but is a way for them to th see if it's a credible lead or not. So I thought that was interesting because you and I, as we've talked, doing our deep dives have known like, hmm, that's not what they said on Unsolved Mysteries. But... Ooh, maybe I wonder if we should have a segment where we point out the things that are um, intentionally added. I would love to. Every, in at least every episode that you and I do, there is some different stuff. So I'm so Definitely some food for thought. Tiny um, details. Her mom also thinks that maybe she just decided that she doesn't know who she is, but she's out there somewhere. Yeah, that, that one is um a good one. It's funny, but it's not yeah. realistic on any it's level. It's wishful thinking from Maybe a meteor came out of the sky and hit her in the head. It's just yeah. not plausible. Anything could happen. But so my main four theories, right? So four. I'm going to... Four theories. <laughs> So I don't want this guy to sue me or us. So I'm just going to call him Keith. Well, this is fan fiction at this point. Okay, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all a big blanket of allegedly right off the top. So right. he was an ex of hers. Add more reason to that, you know. Also, she was pregnant with not, not his baby. Right. So he also owed her $300, which is purportedly why they were at the bank. I just think that's kind of shady that he was the last person seen. He blew off all the police interviews and is not considered a suspect. No, I heard um, I, there was one thing I had read that he had given her $300. But then friends of his said he never had $300 in his life. He's just always broke. There's no way he would even have that sum of money. And he certainly would not be giving it to her. And someone who's pr supposedly his ex-wife is all over the forums of Unsolved Mysteries. And it's like he used to ab obsess about her all the time. He talked about her. The ex-wife's name is a very similar. Her, the ex-wife's name is Terry Lynn. Hmm. And she, she said he was so abusive to me. And he would talk all these horrible things about Tammy. Like, so I think that I think we need to go back there and take a look at Keith. Or, uh, or the other his wife, maybe. Maybe that's her. Talk to, t ooh. Yeah, that's, th that's where I thought you were alluding. No, that is interesting, though. Yeah, let's let's look at Tam. Hey, Tam and, you know, I mean, Update. I'm skeptical. <laughs> I believe everyone is lying to me on the internet, you know? So yeah, yeah. maybe there is no such thing. It's fan there. fiction. Again, everything that we talk about is assumed. Like, we're not, not everything. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this aspect of it. Like, we don't yeah. know if that's really her, but it, sound, it would make for a very good story here. We're just talking fun possibilities. Correct. So the second theory I have is some creeper just saw a vulnerable girl in need running down the side of the road hysterical and was awful and killed her and maybe raped her. You know, I don't know. It seems in broad daylight. It just doesn't. Yeah. 
but he could have been like, hey, sweetheart, I'll give you a ride. Like psychopaths and creepers know vulnerable people, vulnerable people. Like they know who they have the best chance of targeting. Now, what I want to know, and I, I'm going to do um, a quick search. I'm kind of curious if um, people who are involved with Scarface and people who are involved with um, Spring Break, whether one, there's a correlation there. Maybe is there somebody from Spring Break or the same casting director or something like that who happened to live near the bank? Well, why don't you just hold your little horses right there? Because (laughs) I have a theory that I'm coming to. (laughs) All right. All right. My other theory is that she was schizophrenic, having a crazy attack, ran onto traffic. Somebody hit and ran and killed her. And in Florida in July, bodies decompose so quickly. There are so many animals. It's so hot and humid. It's like the perfect place if you wanted to do something like that. Right. Now, have you heard of the website Crazy Days and Nights? No. This is a website I've been aware of for like a decade, probably. Uh, They post celebrity blind items, you know, that are like, oh, which movie star did a whole pile of coke and da da da. And then like five years later, they'll tell you who it was. So you just guess who it is, basically. And then after enough time has passed, they tell you who it is. So can you see what is the um, address again? Crazy Days and Nights. I just want to make sure I have it. Now, there is a blind item that was so long that was just published in 2018 of who it actually was and it involves our little tammy lynn Mm. so i kind of abridged it and here's the synopsis during spring break tammy met the actor paul land who was born paul calandrillo and they had this like hot crazy passionate relationship he thought he was like some kind of maid dude in the mob and he was a tough guy who made his money like selling drugs to actors in Hollywood. So he was like thrilled when she got on the set of Scarface because he's like, I could peddle a whole bunch of drugs this way. So after spring break, they go out partying and this guy kind of tried to move into Paul Land's Florida territory because he was setting up quite the empire for himself. The guy tried to move in on Paul Land's territory and Paul shot him between three to five times. And Tammy was so close to it that she was splattered in blood. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And remember, she had that little freak out when that guy's squibs went off while filming Scarface because he was shot in the head. So she was like, you know, she was three months pregnant. She let him know. And she was like, baby, like, let's just leave all this craziness behind. Let's go and settle down and have like a nice little happy family. So he was like, sure, sure. So he's <laughs> a super jealous guy. And he sees her get into the call, car with Keith. He follows her. And, you know, the, whatever happened to lead to the argument. So Tammy gets kicked out and he kind of swoops in and is like, oh, hey, boo, like we're running into you here. So she gets in the car with him and he's like, let's go to the beach and let's just like make passionate love to each other on the beach. So she's like, OK, so <laughs> okay. I know I'm so <laughs> casual, but so she actually gets out of the car and he's like, come on, baby, let's do this thing. And while she's getting out of the car, he shoots her and disposes of her in a Florida swamp because he wasn't like trying to settle down. And th- he spent the rest of his days doing construction in New Jersey, which I'll let you figure that one out until yeah. he died under very mysterious circumstances. Holy moly. So that. You can't just throw that away. That is some interesting detail celebrity gossip there. That that is excellent. Um, and it, it really kind of correlates a lot of the some of the story that we're talking about. Yeah, like the Connects like, a I just lot keep of going dots. back to her freaking out, you know, during Scarface. Like she and in the reenactment, who knows if this is real or not, but in the reenactment, little Tammy is like, Oh my God, he's going to shoot my head off. Like he's going to kill me too. Just like he did with them. So there's something to it. And Paul Calandrillo was in a lot of these kind of movie. He looks kind of like Frankie Valley. Almost. Yeah, yeah. He looks like he could be a member of um, like on Greece or something. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So he died uh, in like 2003, I want to say 2007, yeah, could- but yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Close. So uh, just quote under very mysterious circumstances. I don't know what that entails, but I want to. It was in his mid 50s or or late 50s. Um, That is, I think that's a really great theory right there. 
Yeah, that's according to that Blind Gossip website. And I mean, they have been right a lot of times. So I've gotten quite a bit of celebrity dirt on that website. So just just, just all stuff to just rattle around in your brain. You figure out which one works best for that scenario. I don't think she's alive still. I could, I'm could. i pretty confident. No. Um, what do you know about the glass bank? Are you familiar with the glass bank? No, but I did see that he actually dropped her off like two blocks away from it. In the police report, it says two blocks away from the bank. Uh, this is down in Miami. I'm in like central, so mm -hmm. I don't really know the area that well. But she, he dropped her off near a payphone by the Exxon station. And she made three frantic phone calls to her aunt's party store called Balloonatics. Mm. And she was like, help, help. Like, somebody's after me. Somebody's after me. And the aunt just wasn't there that day. So she got them messages later. Um, so I think that he was just dropping her off near there. I mean, the area is a very populated area as well. Okay. Like, it's not like you're just dropping somebody off in the middle of nowhere. There's actually a documentary having nothing to do with this, but about the glass bank. And yeah. it was a bit of a structure. It's a very, it was a very interesting building. They demolished it, I believe, in 2015. Oh, and, um, but it's a very strange looking building. And um, I, I think there was something along the lines of people were living in there while it was abandoned. That's what the documentary is about. There's a really crazy, like eccentric multimillionaire who built an apartment above it with no glass because he was just to, I don't know, just to show that you could, I guess. But people are like, well, maybe he stole Tammy in a glassless room where no one could hear her, you know, or see her or anything. So there's so many theories out there. People really like this story because, you know, again, she's a very bubbly looking, very beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. And she just seems she comes off as um, a character who might be very, very innocent and naive. She's in the prime of her life. She is a, you know, I saw Unsolved Mysteries. They tell us she's like 16, 17. Every other thing I saw said she was 18 years old, but mm -hmm. just this young girl starting out, she could have made it. I mean, she was, she did have that like star power. And I think we've talked about this before, but that really resonates with people, with people when they have potential and they're cut down before they can really realize their potential. No, one thing that I th we both totally saw on Ion was the clip at the end. We both disliked this. We th felt as though it was, um, a cheap shot almost. I mean, granted, it's her, her using moment. her words, but she's answering a question in the mindset of being in a pageant. And mm -hmm. I think I don't believe that you could play a pageant answer from anyone. I'm going to go out on a limb 100%. If you were to take anybody, that was yeah. a little bit of my Long Island accent right there. <laughs> percent, you know, um, 100% seeing the R needs to go longer. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, you cannot take somebody's answer. And have them sound, oh, that person sounds very articulate and smart. No. Yeah. It's, and, like, she had lipstick all over her teeth yeah. in it. And it it did feel like they did her dirty. Like, they just left us on that. And it was a weird, like you said, like a cheap shot. It was a weird. Yeah. It, there are other shots that they could have found. I'm sure yeah. of it. Um, they could have even gotten the um, the actress to do, to do one. Oh, little, little Tammy? L yeah, little T. <laughs> Loved her. So... This is a story that I feel like I'd like to go back to. This is a big, big, big story. There's a lot of details mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of opinions. There's wing that's still out there. Yeah. It's a very interesting um, story. I can almost see it becoming one of these um, Hollywood movies because it's oh, one of those yeah. really, it's so simple, but at the same time, it, it really does seem pretty complex. And it's got Lifetime written all over it. Yeah, TV movie. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So now you were a young boy in the 1980s. I sure was. No shade, no shade. In New York, how, were you aware of this whole Hudson Valley yes. UFO sighting? I was. Well, sort hmm. of. Hmm. No, yes and no. I was aware of it um, probably in the nine, like 1990s around when I started getting into UFOs on a as everyone kind of rolls their eyes on a serious level. Mm -hmm. no, I and, get it. Um, and it's when I kind of started, you know, really kind of diving into the different things. And when you find out that strange things are happening kind of in your neighborhood, in a way, this is only maybe an hour and a half from my house right now and where mm -hmm. I grew up. But yeah, the Hudson Valley UFOs, this is our second UFO story. Yes. Sort of second. I mean, we did a whole episode about UFOs. 
And they touched on the Hudson Valley one in that, but this is definitely the deeper story. Um, and do you want to give the overview? You, you seem you have like a gift when it comes to the overviews. Oh my goodness! Well, you thank do. you. So, <laughs> well, we start with Dennis Sant, who says that it's 1983. He's sitting outside, and he just sees like these brightly colored lights hovering silently over his home. So he calls his kids out and he's like, kids, look at this, look at this. He said it hovered for like 20 minutes above his home. And he was like, like a moth to the flame. He was just like happily drawn to it. Yeah. And the girls are like, oh, this is scary. So they go inside, but he, he and his son kept, would like followed it and walked under it. And he was like, this was a big deal in my life. Like, I am certain that these were aliens. And they the actual guy talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, in this segment, they have a lot of the original people talking about yeah. it. And he's not talking about a plane. He's not talking about, he's talking about a silent hovering um, craft. And you know, what, what can hover really back in the early 80s? I mean, nowadays, even a drone, you'll hear a drone, but mm -hmm. maybe a blimp. You know, it, mm. I guess it could have been a blimp, but I, I don't think that's very likely. And he said, like, this happy feeling, like, washed over me. That's what's really odd to me. Like, he was really drawn to this thing. Yeah, people have these spiritual reawakenings whenever they have these kind of experiences. And I guess you could say, like, yeah, he was saying I was questioning everything I was. And mm -hmm. I, you know, everything just kind of felt different um, afterward. Yeah, it was a really big moment for him. And, you know, thankfully, we we did get a few people grabbing their cameras and taking pictures, and we will post those on the Unsolved Mysteries Rewind Facebook page. But I thought that was really interesting to see what they were seeing. No, and we see a police officer. A police officer is kind of dumbfounded. She's sitting there um, proudly displaying the fact that she's creating a speed trap. <laughs> I know. I loved her. She, I loved her yeah, and I loved reenactment her. Like they were both amazing. Yeah. I, I thought that that was kind of like, she would look bored and everything. It was just yeah. like probably the most accurate depiction. Um, yeah. They said it was like from 12 to 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just sitting there waiting for a speeder, you know, and she just sees this thing coming and it's all of a sudden above her and Somebody calls it in. She's like, I see it too. And they're following it. They're following it through the hills of Hudson Valley. Now, mm -hmm. Hudson Valley is a very affluent area. So you have a lot of uh, a lot of wealthy people, a lot of large houses, a lot of open space as well. So it's just you're not going to have a lot of people who are in this demographic coming forward to say, I saw a UFO for no reason. I hear you on that, but I think that Unsolved Mysteries was kind of rude in the way that they said that. Like, they were like, these people are not your usual UFO crazies. Like, they have money, <laughs> yeah. you know? It was like, all right, well, damn, I'm, I'm sitting here watching Unsolved Mysteries. This is a judgment-free zone, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I didn't like it. Right. I'm sitting here eating my peanut butter sandwich watching Unsolved Mysteries. What are you saying? Don't, don't you judge me, Robert Stack. <laughs> I'm out of jelly. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I think um, what he's really kind of getting at is um, this really is a very... Um, there are mansions in the Hudson Valley. There are property that's, you know, half the size of your property. <laughs> so, <laughs> but New York prices. So, yeah, but it, it's a lot of people do the commute into Manhattan, but it, it's a really lovely area and you just, it's really quiet and nothing exciting usually happens in Hudson Valley. One thing I did discover, cause I started kind of mapping it out a little bit. Um, have you ever heard of Whitley Stryber, the author? No. So Whitley Stryber, he wrote um, a very famous book called Communion, which was made into a movie in, um, I think in the 80s it was made. So, And he also made a horror movie called Wolfen. Have you ever heard of Wolfen by any chance? No. Oh, All right, Wolfen is about um, kind of like a werewolf type of wolf that would attack people in the middle of the night. Whitley Stryber, who's still around, thank goodness, he's getting older. Um. He went and did a number of sessions with hypnosis and things, and he uncovered the fact that his mo that his book Wolfen was his depiction of being abducted by aliens. Huh. Um, the Greys and the, or Zeta Reticuli that we discussed in our um, other episode. 
Mm-hmm. And Whitley Stryber, he's a, he's a wonderful author. He really is. But when you reread Wolfen as um, a UFO um, abduction, because it, it's written as a horror book, like a Stephen mm-hmm. King level, it, it really takes on a whole different world. And that's what communion is about. And it, it goes all the way back to when he was a child. And he, he lived about 50 miles. I think he still does. About 50 miles from where all of this was happening. He lived oh, in Middletown, New wow. York. He lives in Middletown, huh. New York. Um, and he's, he's become one of these huge figures in the UFO community. He has a podcast. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it. I have to look it up. But he's one of these guys who is really, really into it. And he always describes this area. So he was one of the people who I first started reading about and then came across the whole Hudson Valley phenomena because this went on for several years, all of these sightings. Yeah, this went on from 1983 to 1989. And there's not as many videos and amazing images as you might think that were taken over the course of six years. No, definitely not. But there are a few that I have baited to gifts and I will happily post on the Unsolved Mysteries. Your gifts are magic. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I rip them and I don't know how legal it is, but you know what? I'm doing it for you guys. Now, this is another thing with Hudson Valley. I don't believe that there's any type of military installation up there. There's Mm -hmm. nothing that it could be outside of unexplained phenomena. There's no real reason to test anything. It's far enough away from JFK and LaGuardia. So it's Mm -hmm. not any type of commercial aircraft. I mean, over my house, I mean, not right now because of all the lockdown and everything, but I'm only 10 miles away, not even 10 miles from JFK airport. So I don't know if you've heard planes go over my house in the past. No, I haven't. (laughs) Um, One of these, what I should do is um, when I first moved back to this area, I couldn't believe how low the planes were because you kind of forget. Mm -hmm. And I'll post a picture of how close they are to my house. It's kind of, Kind of insane. Like, there's something with the five towns, and I, I shouldn't really be pinpointing my location, but in the five towns, if you're talking to somebody, mm-hmm. you stop talking in the middle uh, so the plane can go over. Mm. <laughs> it becomes a, a, something that's um, a bit habitual. Mm. But in the Hudson Valley, it's silent. It's very quiet. It's, you're on your way upstate or you're coming into the city, so you're driving through the Hudson uh, Hudson Valley. Mm. Um. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about all of this? There's thousands of people who have seen this, who have recorded Mm -hmm. it. Okay. I don't know what I think about it. And that's kind of what I like because there, it could be anything. I am happy that we got this on footage because then it's like, Ooh, I can see it. And I can experience what you were experiencing. I think it's really weird that there was like no sound. Yeah. with these crafts and people were saying, you know, it was like stunt pilots doing illegal nighttime maneuvers just to like, you know, I mean, interesting. This is kind of in the era of Top Gun. Maybe they were trying to do some stuff like but that. But those are know. loud. Like an F-14 is a very loud yeah. jet. Um, and these but, are quiet, like crafts hovering like that is weird. They also show one of the videos that I think is really interesting where it's, um, they're in kind of a triangular formation. Yes. And they're locked on each other. It's like, mm-hmm. There's no movement. There's no swaying. Then they show another one where it's stunt pilots. And you can clearly see that each plane is kind of coming out of formation and it's not as perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there are people doing it and people aren't flawless, you know. But if it is one big machine, then it would make sense that the lights wouldn't move around like they would with the test pilots. So I don't know. It's food for thought. You know, I've said this before on our all alien extravaganza, but I definitely believe that there are aliens yeah. out there. Well, here's the big red letter question. Mm. Have you, Kim, have, ever, have you ever seen no. a UFO or anything no. unidentified rather? Can't say as I have. No, I've seen like I've seen a drone and I was all excited about that. But no, that's <laughs> that's the most I've ever seen. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've never seen anything that I, I would chalk up to anything that would be amazing. At best, I saw lights. But again, I live very close to airports, so it's very difficult to. But I'm just saying, I know this sounds crazy, but isn't that where they would come down where you think, oh, I'm just being crazy. That's an airplane. Like, that's the perfect excuse. Uh, I, I feel like, uh, I mean, they might actually not because of radar and detection i don't know why they don't want to be detected i don't have a good answer as to this is america and we gun them down yeah 
we did before, right? In 1947, was it? Uh, exactly. Now, if you're listening to this podcast and you've seen a UFO, yes. I recommend two particular websites, um, one more than the other for my own personal political reasons. But there's um, newfork.org, which is N-U-F-O-R-C.org, or there's MUFON. Dot, whoops, I just clicked off mm-hmm. my dopey thing. Yeah, MUFON.com. Yeah. MUFON stands for the Mutual UFO Network. And you kind of have to pay to play with MUFON, which is one of the reasons why I, although MUFON does a wonderful, wonderful job of investigating, I don't like pay to play information. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, and it, it's not exactly cheap either. But the other one is the National UFO Reporting Center. It's a lot of interesting stuff. You just, there's a link right on top. Website looks like it was made sometime between 1994 and 1996, <laughs> and it, but it works. And you can, what's really wonderful about this is you can just kind of click it. You go to the year. It goes all the way back to, well, it goes to ridiculous dates, but it goes all the way back to the 50s. And you can even report something you might have seen in the 80s or the oh. 70s or, and, or in our case, the 90s or 2000s. <laughs> and it kind of brings you to a very rudimentary, very basic list of things. So near um, on December 14th, 2019 in Maryland, there was a two to three minute light, two yellow lights flying over the power line, causing the street lines to flicker constantly. Hmm. You can just make these reports. Um, you can, people put links to local uh, things and, and that's it. Some things are very interesting because you'll see a number of people in the same area posting the mm. same thing. And I, I think that's think. where this is. Kind of interesting. Whether you believe it or not, it's really beside the point. It's more along the lines of there is a place to report it. And Don't call nine one one. No, no. <laughs> and if I could give a third place to report your UFO sighting, oh, yes. um, Unsolved Mysteries Rewind podcast Facebook page. I want to hear about it. I, yes. <laughs> I was going to say we pay for tips, but we don't. <laughs> oh, no, no. We have no money. Please no. don't come after us. <laughs> we, we have coupons, though. We can, we can give you funny coupons. So, yeah, oh, I love that. Yeah. But um, in all seriousness, if you do have a story to tell, please reach out to us. Um, yeah. Unsolved Mysteries Rewind. I still have yet to set up our email addresses. So, yeah, but it's on Facebook. You can find us there. Yeah. It's, yes. Um, but, yes, absolutely. Um, Should we talk about our Daredevil Doe? Yes, this is um, this is a sad story, right? Oh my god, this one really <laughs> bummed me out. Because yeah, I pictured the guy looking. Um, I don't know if you ever watched MacGyver. Mm-hmm, I um, know. I, I I pictured the the actor from MacGyver as being um, this. He just I don't know. I like the actor. There was something about the entire desperation of this particular scenario that really kind of bummed me out as well. Yeah, and Um, the actor who played him, it has hundreds, if not thousands, of IMDb acting credits because he's a stuntman. Oh, really? So he really did that? Yes. (laughs) Love it. I love it even more now. It's so good. It's it's such a sad, crazy story. So we go to Paducah, Kentucky in 1991, September 1991, and this man comes up sharp leather jacket and he is frantic and he goes up to the kid who's just like filling airplanes and washing them off and stuff and it's an airfield so a he goes up a and dick he, actually yeah and they had him in the reenactment and he just kept saying the same thing he's like hey can i are you a pilot and he goes no i'm sure not and he goes do you know where i can find one he goes no i sure don't <laughs> <laughs> now, now told me he got to get out of here yeah, exactly. And the guy was like, I'll give you this jacket. I just need to ride. I need to go out west. I need to go out west. And he's like, you got to get out of here, man. Like, this is a small, private little airfield. You can't be around here telling people you'll give them your jacket. for <laughs> Between you and me, it was a nice jacket. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was kind of battered, but I didn't know if that's because of what happens later. It's like a obviously- flight jacket. That's what it reminded me of. And speaking of Top Gun, it was very, like, leather, uh, nice, yeah. like, ready to go. So he the guy's like scram get out of here so he's walking along and the kid the kind of drunk kid (laughs) kicking cans yeah with his hands in his pocket and (laughs) the kid drives past and he's just like oh there's that weirdo and he looks in his rearview mirror as he passes and the guy who we will call our daredevil doe hops a barbed wire fence runs 800 feet down a ditch and onto a moving airplane 
like a Cessna. Like, no, yeah. it was like a jet, right? There were no propellers. No, there were no propellers. And he just like hops on the wing and he is just holding on for dear life. He's just like, whoop. And he hops on this thing. We see the plane take off. The guy is actually on there kicking his little feet and everything. It's like, oh my God. But you can't do that. I mean, you can't no. go on a little plane. And the guys, let's say the guy's like 180 pounds. He's yeah. jumping on the side of a wing. You can't do that. Like, it's not. No. That's what I thought too. That's going to like completely make the guy like do loop de loops and stuff. Right. But I would cry. Yeah. I actually, that was just for the magic of television because he actually um, jumped under the wheel well and was trying to stow away there. That makes more sense. Yeah. So he like hops onto the landing gear in real life, but for the purpose of unsolved mysteries, this guy is really on this airplane and the airplane takes air and I will post that gift. It's the so, most exciting. I'm going to say it's the most exciting thing that we've seen on unsolved mysteries that we've yeah. reviewed so far. I agree. And next I to the UFO. Sorry. Well, I didn't know this one by title, Daredevil Doe, but I definitely remember this story. So he hops on and then the plane goes like 3,000, 3,500 feet in the air. The wind force against the wing or landing gear or what have you is 190 miles per hour. And we just see this airplane take off and this body fall 3,000 feet. And obviously that's a dummy, but oh my yeah. God, it was harrowing to see. So they're like, whoa what happened there something just fell off so the security's going out and they're searching and they're like what's going on they see this body and i'll oh put the picture because it's just the reenactment this i almost wanted to cry i'm not kidding you like he was mangled in the fence because it's a chain link fence so his like fingers caught one way his toes caught another way his like one of his shoes is knocked off and this guy is dead 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 and the fence is mangled it's it's yeah. really as though they took something and bash the fence to make it look mm. as real as possible, I would imagine that's kind of what it would look like. It looked Maybe so worse. real that it like gave me a pit in my stomach. Like, oh, it, it was it was too much. Like I was expecting them to fade out to the actual photograph of finding him or something. Yeah, and like they could have just shown the security guard being like, "Oh my god!" Like I'm, we we got the point. I'm just glad that we never have to see what the body looked like, right? Well, Oh, we kind of do. Um, we? Well, you and I have seen <laughs> an article where we totally see the body because they need to know who this guy is. He has no identification on him. Okay. In the jacket, there is a pair of swim goggles. I don't know what that's about. That's random. Yeah. And we talked to coroner Jerry Byer, who I need to make up an award just so I can give this to this man. I, I'm serious when I say that he is a hero in this whole story. I love Jerry Byer. So he sees like, Oh, his nails are nice. Oh, no tan lines, you know? And he's like, oh, his pubic hair is shaved. Right. Uh, you Straight know who was faced, just here? Yeah. Chippendales was just here. I bet he was one of the Chippendales dancers, which is a good avenue to go down. Now, this is the coroner saying this. Yeah. The coroner's like, oh. Oh, I know I about know. those Chippendale dancers. <laughs> yeah. You know, what he does in his personal time, yeah. none of our business. So they go and investigate that. Nope. All the Chippendales people are accounted for. So they can't find who he is so unsolved mystery shows us the leather jacket and the tag of the jacket is inscribed with lieutenant lf price usaf right United states air force no such person exists what is that about this is like a black ops type of situation yeah i have no clue what this is about because at first, I'm thinking, okay, that may or may not be him because what if he got it from a thrift store? You know, who knows where that came from? But there's nobody ever that's existed with that name. That And they never touch on it. So what is that about? Now, here, here's something I, I kind of know a little bit about. Um, and this is, I, I should have done a little bit more research on this, but so you could, um, I, I was once in the business of military uh, surplus hmm. and nothing, nothing illegal. But um, you could buy uniforms and, you know, yeah. there are, there's a large market for buying for reenactors for like Vietnam era um, actual uniforms, yeah, you know, totally. whether it be Israeli or, you know, from um, from wherever. So there was this great place called Tereshinsky's in um, Brooklyn, and he would just have this huge, huge, huge thing. And we're going through it one day and I didn't know much about actual uniforms. So I'm going through and they do have the name of each and every soldier who mm -hmm. used them. Mm. You know, on the um, each item, and it just struck me. It, it just really kind of thought. I just thought it was kind of 
crazy, but you do not inscribe your name unless it's legitimate. So I, if there is nobody who is doing that, there's one of two things. One, he's, you know, faking, you know, well, three okay. things. It could be a movie type thing, I guess. Um, you know, could, I guess it could be a prop type thing. Okay. Or it's like a black ops type situation. And that's kind of like where I'm leaning hmm. with this guy. Well, now I have, I love this. I'm with you, but I have something interesting to add, which I'll add when we get to the end of the story. Cause I think it just makes more sense, but that is really interesting. I didn't think about it that way. So we don't know who he is. Unsolved Mysteries ends with like, do you know this guy? And they kind of give us a drawn version of his, of his face. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that was his actual like dead body in Unsolved Mysteries, but it definitely was in the newspaper article that we both read from the Paducah Sun. Yes. So in 1999, almost eight years to like to the day almost that he died, he is identified positively through fingerprints as Brian Stanley Duker. Now, his stepmother, Dee, hadn't seen him for like three to four years, but she had visions of him falling from a high height to his yeah, This is crazy. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So she contacted the police after seeing an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, after seeing a rerun, and was like, I think that's my stepson. And he had some like petty misdemeanors in his past, so his prints were on record, but for some reason they never got checked. So for like another four years, she had to wonder where her stepson was when it was him the whole time. So she saw the picture of his body in the newspaper was like, that was him. He's paranoid schizophrenic and he hated taking his medication. Mm. So now he, when they went to his house, when his parents like went to his house to see like, Oh, we haven't heard from Brian in a while. He had handwritten a will like that day and had said like had written all over like i need to go out west i need to climb mountains that was his thing i need to go out west to climb mountains so if he's paranoid schizophrenic that kind of explains to me the whole reason why he's hopping the fence and getting on the airplane because he genuinely thinks people are after him but could that also be the reason why he would put a fake name on his stuff oh that's a great point like that i, I didn't think about it until you until you had mentioned it but that like if he's trying to throw people off his track. Oh, that's a great idea. I mean, yeah, I think I'm I'm kind of leaning towards that now. Yeah, I mean, it just it just makes sense with how scared he was. I love that's, that. That's great. Well, that's such a huge bummer because like whatever was happening in his life, the days, weeks, months, definitely minutes like leading up to his death were in such a state of terror that oh god, it just really makes me sad for him. And so buyer our hero coroner who knows all about the chippendales touring schedule he took this so seriously he arranged the entire funeral he would go weekly and like clean up his grave put flowers on it whenever he went on vacation he would take the sketch of the body and he would take the identifiers like the jacket and stuff and he would take them to police stations where he would vacation or whenever he would go out of town to try and get an id for this guy Wow. So it seems like P Paducah, Kentucky, where it was, it has a population of about 28,000 in 1991. But these people really, really adopted him as their own son, kind of Brian. They were like, it is so sad that he doesn't have anybody. And we consider him one of ours. People would, would write funeral cards to him all the time. And they had a really nice gravestone for him. So his stepmother, D actually decided to leave his body in Paducah because of how nice everyone was there to him mm -hmm. and how respectful everyone was. But they updated the tombstone to say, this is, you know, Stanley, Brian Stanley Duger. And we are just, he was a beloved son. And after eight years, we were able to identify him. But it seems to me like Bayer, the coroner, is the driving force. He was the one who called Unsolved Mysteries. Like he got this guy identified and I just really love that about him. This is a perfect story for the show as well, for Unsolved mm -hmm. Mysteries. It just doesn't, there's an ending. It, it is, um, it does still have a lot of strangeness associated to it. We don't know the full story, but we know enough of it to at least know that there was, this was a troubled person and, but he's laid yeah. to rest and is we think it's his proper name. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, no, it is. He was identified. And um, I just, oh, of course, now I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, the production value on this episode was crazy. Mm -hmm. 
they had that guy truly on the wing of an airplane when it was off of the ground. Like, I've never seen stunts like this in Unsolved Mysteries before. No, it's definitely the number one stunt of the show. It's uh, it's really exciting to see because you're looking at it and you're like, oh, they're going to go away. I'm like, no, he's actually jumping on that plane. Whose plane is this? You know, like, where did they get? Yeah. And like the whole time the guy's like searching for handholds while it's up in the air and you see his legs kicking and stuff. So that's definitely a real guy up there. Now, I did want to um, share a quick story about something that happened in a town that I lived in called Island Park um, here on Long Island. That, that so, was like right before 9-11. Yeah, this is um, literally a month before yeah. 9-11. So um, it, it's a fairly, well, it was fairly common where people would, in desperation, try to hide into the wheel wells of I don't know exactly what kind of plane this was, but from what I remember, it was like a 747. Hmm. The The theory is, is that they'll go, they'll hold on to the wheel well. And the, um, once they're up to a certain speed, the landing gear will retract into the body of the plane where it is a little bit more climate controlled. Hmm. Because of course you'll freeze to death if, you know, if you go up there too quickly. Um, and plus you can't breathe. So it, it's just really crazy. So in September 11, I mean, I'm sorry, August 9th, 2001, we, um, I didn't hear this happen or anything like that. And, um, but this did happen during, um, business hours, which is what's crazy to me. And I don't know anybody who saw it either, which is what, you know, I'm kind of like, uh, but we had just been there like maybe a night or two before because oh, it was wow. kind of a club area. It's like on the water. It's very nice. And we all would like kind of go there and drink and we would kind of walk home because it really was, it's a, it's, it's a, a boating town essentially. Mm -hmm. like my house was on a dock, you know, and we, it's a place called Jordan lobster. I'm just going to put their name out there. I think it's pretty common knowledge that this happened in front of Jordan lobster and which is a great place. Actually, they wonderful food <laughs> and <laughs> it's very family friendly. <laughs> so we again we live right near JFK. So the landing gear very often when you look up into the sky and you hear a plane, the landing gear is down already. Mm -hmm. So where Island Park is is right. It's like a couple more miles from where I currently am, and I guess the gear is coming down, and it's kind of over the ocean. And mm -hmm. from what I understand, very often these bodies will just go into the ocean. But mm -hmm. from what I understand, the body froze. And mm. right in front of Jordan Lobster, right in the middle of the street, a body just came crashing down. Oh, my God. And there was an indentation in the street <gasps> for about two years. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, because it's just blacktop, you know. It's just, you know. And I remember every – I didn't think about the indentation until somebody brought it up to me. Like six months later, it was like um, like fall. And they're like, you know, the um, we were talking about it, and I think I brought up, I wonder if that happens more often than we realize. This is after 9-11, of course. And we mm -hmm. hop in our cars just to go over there, and we're driving over in the car. You feel the dip in the car. Oh this guy God. made real impact. I'm laughing more out of, like, I'm so, I'm I feel terrible for yeah, this guy. Yeah. But he apparently snuck on in London, got into the wheel well, froze to death. Huh. Um, and when the landing gear came down, of course, the body came down like a sack of potatoes yeah. and yeah. boom, um, it, it's just, it was one of those kind of things where you have to wonder the Atlantic ocean there and all of these mm. water canals, does this happen more often than we even know? Wow. Not yeah, nowadays, it, but yeah, especially in a pre nine 11 world. Exactly. Yeah. So I just yeah. thought that that was kind of crazy. Um, Whoa. yeah, air, airplane stuff is, um, is crazy. <laughs> So I, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. It's, but um, I couldn't imagine being so desperate that I need to try to jump on a plane because what this person did is so much more desperate and sad. So mm -hmm. hopefully whatever happened, it happened quickly. And this person, when um, I'm talking about the um, Brian, the unsolved mystery. Yeah. Brian, hopefully when he made impact, his life was just over. Like hopefully yeah. there wasn't any suffering. I'm, I will imagine that he was dead. Yeah, that's all you can hope for, really. I mean, it was, like I said, who knows how long this guy was living in absolute terror. Obviously, his last moments on this earth were in terror. So hopefully he has some peace now that he didn't have when he was here. That's all we can do. I just want to look up Jordan Lobster's website and give them a little bit of a plug. They okay. always have deals. They're great. JordanLobsterFarms.com. 
Nice. Nice. Uh, really, really excellent, excellent food. <laughs> yeah. And an excellent episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah. Um, and that is because of your work, Kim. Thank you so much for the effort that you put into this podcast. My goodness. Thank you. I couldn't do it without you. I'm happy to do it with you. It's a fun to have a partner in crime for all these crazy, crazy stories. Yes. And if you have any questions, please visit us on Unsolved Mysteries Rewind on Facebook. There are yeah. ways of reaching out to us. It's Mark and Kim. And mm-hmm. I guess that's it. It's another one in the can, in the, in the coffin. Ooh, too no, soon, too soon. Too soon. Tonight, we have been confronted with an entire catalog of unexplained and unsolved events. Tune in next time as Unsolved Mysteries Rewind discusses another collection of unsolved mysteries. Until then, we can only look and wonder.